Ladies and gentlemen, good morning once again. Will you please take a seat at this time? And will you also please welcome Fortune Magazine's managing editor at large, Adam Lashinsky. Good, good morning. I don't know if Andy Server's in the room, but I did not write that, Andy. No, I didn't. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, my, my title and my boss's title were conflated in that introduction this morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome, uh, welcome to our first morning of Brainstorm Tech 2009. I want to remind you, you have three opportunities to interact with the people on stage uh, today. One is through the Spot Me device, which is pretty cool. I think people are kind of having fun with this thing. Um, secondly, through Twitter. The Twitter uh, hashtag is hashtag brainstorm tech or pound brainstorm tech and through Q&A uh, at the end. Without further ado, I want to introduce, first of all, the father, the godfather, the guardian angel of brainstorm, the reason we're all here, my colleague David Kirkpatrick, who will introduce Tim Armstrong. Please welcome David Kirkpatrick and Tim Armstrong. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Um, so Tim Armstrong has this sort of entrepreneurial gene that you wouldn't expect for somebody who's always been in companies. Of course, you may not know his whole history. Uh, as soon as he got out of college, he started a newspaper for kids in Cambridge, Boston area. It was called Beginnings in Boston. Then he took over his competitor, like within the first year. And then, was it the next year? The next year, he saw the internet browser demonstrated by a team from Mosaic. It was that early. And the, he claims the day he saw the demo, he called his parents and said, I'm getting out of this. I'm going to do internet stuff. Right? And he discovered that uh, IDG had a magazine called iWay, which was the only consumer internet magazine out there. He went there, and within like six months, he was the publisher of that. So he has a magazine background. Oh, the one thing I also didn't say is, when he read Fortune magazine from the time he was in junior high school, because he was so into business. Um, but then, of course, he went to Starwave, uh, da, 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 ended up at Google as the first real ad person in New York, created Google's office in New York, which now has, what, like 2,500 employees or something? I don't know what the latest number, 2,000. It's, it's a lot of people. And, uh, but he, was, he came and worked out of his apartment at the very beginning. And you know, somebody from Google going to AOL, it, it, it reminds me a little bit of Sheryl Sandberg going to Facebook. Uh, I'm a Facebook obsessed person, as some of you know. Um, you know, when anybody who doesn't have to work goes to a new job where they have to work really hard, you have to pay attention and ask yourself, why is that happening? Um, and I think we'll probably figure that out as we hear Tim talk. But before we start, uh, we're going to have one of these spot me questions, and I need to see the question, this, this thing on the screen right now, or we don't have time to do it. Uh, anyway, this, we're supposed to be a demonstrate something to tell you how to use the spot me device, which I don't have in front of me, so I can't tell you. Okay, here we go. Is that there? We go. This is how you vote. Press the blue context menu. Select voting. Okay. Open keypad to view numbers. Get ready to vote, and you have three choices. Okay. So can we also see the question? Okay. Here's the question. AOL will, number one, slowly run out of juice. Number two, remain profitable but not a significant industry force, which is kind of where we all sort of assumed it's been for a long time, and maybe not profitable for too much longer, more the first. Number three, return to health as a major internet player. We know what Tim would say, otherwise he wouldn't have taken the job. But quickly make your choice on that, and I'm going to not uh, talk about that anymore. But uh, <clears throat> so, Tim. Why would somebody who doesn't have to work go to AOL and take this job at a company that so many of us have the view is kind of an also ran? So I think, uh, let me ask that one minute, but thank you for having us uh, today. It means a lot to be uh, at Fortune. And uh, I think, too, is I heard last night that there were startups pitching, and Ron yeah. Conway on the spot offered them money. So yeah. Ron, at the end of this, I'm going to expect an offer for money. I don't know what Ron is. But <laughs> I think Ron would give you money. Yeah. Uh, so I, really, I, the reason that uh, the reason I went to AOL was one is you know I've been a long-term partner of Time Warner's and, and AOL while I was at Google, and I think I knew a fair amount about the company, 
And then the, the second piece of it, which was, I, I think, you know, I'm a fundamental believer that the internet space is just getting started. And, you know, AOL, I think, offers, you know, if not the biggest, one of the biggest challenges, um, but also one of the biggest opportunities on the internet. And what I mean by that is it's very hard to build a global brand. It's very hard to be in a space where both consumers and uh, customers, advertisers, partners will consider you. And I think AOL was in a, is in a, is in a very good space to be a player in the future of the internet. Uh, it's going to take a lot of work, but I, I, I find that was my fundamental belief when I went there. Well, you know, um, there was some talk uh, on the blogs that you have a plan to dominate certain spaces. Uh, is it true that you've used that word? And is it conceivable that AOL could dominate anything at this point? So uh, I think one, I don't think I've used that word. You haven't? Uh, I, don't, I don't believe so. OK. Um, Would you use that word? Uh, I don't think so. But, no? OK. Uh, I think we have plans to significantly increase AOL and the viability of AOL and what we're focused on. I do think there's white space areas on the internet, which AOL can play well and it fits our brand, fits what, you know, really what consumers want. And, you know, again, I think what we're hoping to be is a leading player in these areas. I think there are um, a lot of assets at AOL that people probably don't recognize and think about, but I think the collection of assets um, can provide the company with a lot of strength in some of those white space areas. Well, talk about, you've, you've, come, you've concluded that there's four areas you want to focus on. Just quickly tell us what those are. Sure, so the uh, first one is uh, content, um, and we, we think about content from more of a Silicon Valley type approach to content, which is content management systems and, and scaled content. Second piece is uh, display advertising, and display advertising is split into two areas. I think one is is, you know, how do we monetize our owned and operated content and partner content? And then two is how do we scale advertising.com? And I think, you know, that's, that's something I'm happy to talk more about. Um, third is local and mapping. So, you know, MapQuest remains one of the largest brands online for mapping. Um, it's, it's probably missed a generation of technology, which we're working on right now. And local is something that, you know, I'm very personally passionate about. I think it's actually something that's good for most countries in the world, that there's a lot, there's a lack of local information. So I think we're going to focus there. And then the fourth piece is, um, you know, I think historically has really been looked at at AOL as like a way to make money, um, but it's the messaging components, which is email, IM, SMS, those things. And I think we look at it from more of a network effect uh, of what that business offers. And then the, the fifth bucket, um, and he's here today, actually, John Broad, the, the person who's running AOL Ventures, is we also create, it's not really a strategy as much as it is, um, well, at AOL is a strategy, at other companies it might not be, but a membrane around the company to bring innovation in and out of the company in AOL Ventures. And I think, you know, when you take a bigger step back and look at it, it's, you know, it's, it's content, you know, ads, and local. Um, with fundamentals underneath it, the communications, mobile, global, um, those things, and then AOL Ventures, which should allow us to actually have a very good level of innovation and a, and a way to corral startups and P&Ls in, in a very good way. Well, you know, it's interesting. AIM in particular, you still have a tremendous position. I mean, you're not, are you number one in, in, I, in this semester? I don't believe we're number you're, one. You're anymore. very good. We're very good. You've still got we're a very, very good. good business. Right. And I mean, most kids who use Facebook also use AIM, even still. Right. So how can you make that into a business, though? I mean, it's kind of been out there doing great without making right. money, right? Yeah, I think that the first thing with AIM, and ICQ also, I point out. Um, ICQ too. Yeah, ICQ, both very, very powerful brands, messaging brands on the internet. And I think you hit on a key point, which is, you know, kids use it because it actually works really well. And I would argue the messaging space is split into multiple segments, one-to-one, -one, one to many many-to-many. You know, we're very good at the one-to-one, -one, you know, messaging component. And I think, you know, for us, the real, again, I want to be clear about this. I think the AIM and ICQ as a business proposition, they're actually good business propositions. If you think about the core value they bring to consumers and what they bring to AOL, you know, money is, you know, in the top two objectives, it may not be number one. And I think it's more important for us to provide that level of communication and recirculation uh, for, for those users. And I think that is some, we have some specific things I won't go into there that we're looking at, but I, I'm excited about that. So convert them into people who look at your ads in some way or another. Well, I think that that's, that's the old strategy at AOL, which is, you know, get them on and make them look at ads. And I think we, we probably will have a slightly different strategy going forward. Can you give me a hint? What would be different? Uh, what would be a different way to do that? I could, but then I'd have to kill you. Well, you'd have to kill more than just me. Oh, that's true, actually. Um, but, uh, but, you know, this issue of ads, uh, you know, pretty much if you look at your overall, all the, the areas you're focusing on, uh, owned and operated content, 
you know, advertising business and you know, local, those in particular, uh, you're assuming that essentially display advertising still is a, an effective way to monetize content, right? Right. Um, interestingly, Bob Iger yesterday had some interesting statistics, that, and I'd never heard it spoken of this way. He said, the average consumer spends 25 cents an hour to watch TV, 50 cents an hour to watch internet content, and $5 an hour to watch a movie, and he uses that as an argument that presumably that internet number could go higher. Right. I think I got it right. Um, but does that kind of logic make sense to you, that there is content on the internet that you can get more money for right. one way or another, and is it through advertising? Yeah, I think, I mean, it, let's take a, you know, a giant step back, is think about how much people's time has shifted online and, and the basic element of how much advertising has followed that and shifted. And I, I still think we're in a very large trade win, which is consumer behavior is changing, you know, continues to change drastically. Even the last couple of years online, things have changed even a lot more. Um, you know, I think advertisers were just catching up to the first wave of the internet change. You know, we've had one or two other cycles beyond that now. And I think, you know, is monetization on the internet going to go up? I think you'd have to argue, you know, yes. I think that, you know, from a time spent, value spent, value you get out of the internet today, it's under monetized as a whole. And so I would agree with what Bob said. I mean, um, I'm sure he has more information about the movie sector, but I, I agree with him. But I mean, you are. If anybody understands advertising on the internet, it's probably you, because you ran advertising at Google, which has like 60% of the ad revenue on the internet, right? So I do think you have credibility on this, but when I hear AOL putting so much emphasis on developing these content businesses in these niches, and I look at what has happened at other parts of Time Warner and a heck of a lot of other media companies, it, it, aside from startups, which seem to be doing a little better in it, and, and whether a lot of them are really gonna make money in, in enough quantity to justify the investment is unclear. Right. I mean, nobody's really proven that these niche content businesses can really be lucrative, right. but you believe they can be. Yeah, I think because, I think there's two ways to look at them. I think there's, and then, by the way, when we've been out talking about the strategy with employees and other partners, this question comes up. And I think, you know, you have to take, and this is what I was t talking about, I don't know if we were talking earlier or now about it, but the Silicon Valley kind of approach you know, to content, just like we did with ads. I mean, I think one of the things that has worked very well for, you know, for Google, and, and I'll let Google comment on what, what their business is, but, you know, Google did a very good job of actually building the systematic plumbing approach underneath the advertising business, which really allowed it to scale, and I think that's the same type of mentality, you know, we will bring to the content space, and, and currently what we're looking at. And so, so I think, you know, the, the, the reality is, if you think about, just broadly, let's talk about the, the number of investments and size of investments that have gone into ad systems you know, online My, I would, versus content systems. I would argue there's been a much larger um, investment in ad systems than there have been on content systems online. And is there an opportunity to have more sophisticated content management systems which actually connect with advertising systems? I mean, I, clearly that's one of the areas that we, we think is a white space and that we're gonna, that we're gonna work very diligently on. And, and technology to do that in a sort of cutting edge way is something you think you can bring to the party. Yes. Yeah, so this is also a sort of a surprising notion that AOL could be a cutting edge technology company Again, I don't know if they ever really were. They were a great company, but whether, I, nobody ever really thought of them. Maybe Kara knows more than I do, but were they ever a great technology company, Kara? They had a lot. Of technology. They had a lot. Okay, but uh, thank you. Good to have you here. She's an AOL expert. Um, how can how you said search? You said you know. I mean, you said maps. Yeah. You said you're going to bypass a generation and be competitive with you know who in maps. Clearly, how are you going to do that? Uh, one is just making sure you have the right engineering behind the maps. I mean, one of the specific things, so I, I've traveled around, you know, for the last hundred days, um, which are over now, and now we're back to work, is, you know, MapQuest is one of the places I went to visit. We have a place, part of the, the company is in uh, Pennsylvania, actually, and part of it is in um, Denver, and I went to both areas, and I think once we started to look through what the issues were with MapQuest, you know, a lot of them are not strategy business. There, there are issues with that, and we're correct. I can talk about that a little bit if you want to talk about it. A lot of it was, do we have the right engineers, right? So there's, there's a certain set of engineering around geocoding, which MapQuest historically has been missing, and that's what I would argue, you know, our competitors have probably actually invested in more. So, you know, we're right now, 
really looking to upgrade that area of MapQuest. And, and for a consumer, you know, should, do they care whether or not we have the right engineers? The answer is yes, right? Because you go to MapQuest today and there's not a single sign-in box. There's actually multiple sign-in box, which was helpful in some degrees and helpful, not helpful in other, in other ways. So you know, I think there are areas within our business where technology is really important. It's really important to identify what elements we're missing, and then it's really important to make sure we're in the technology communities which are actually innovating in that space. And I think specifically for a MapQuest, you know, that's what we're doing. We, I did, I've probably done four or five MapQuest reviews since I've been there. We just did one um, at the end of last week. And, you know, that, that review gets down to that engineering level of, you know, who is actually working on the code? What are they coding? What layers can you put into the mapping space? you know, in there because at the end of the day, you know, as a consumer, you hit the front page of a mapping site, you can almost tell instantaneously what your experience is going to be. And I think that is, right. look, we're accountable for that, right? We own MapQuest. We're in charge of it. You know, we're not in charge of anything else other than our properties, and, and we have to have the right people working on it. Um, one thing we, we hadn't talked about, tomorrow you're speaking to your employees. You're going to give them the result of your 100 days. It's just a little more than 100 days since you arrived at AOL. I didn't introduce you as fully as I should have, I suppose. There's so much to say about you, Tim. But um, tomorrow you're meeting with the employees. Talk to a, a, us a little bit about what you, your process of what you went through when you got to the company, because I think it's quite extraordinary, um, and, 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 and what the end result is intended to be tomorrow. Sure. So before I got to the company, I got a lot of advice from different people about what to do, and, and everybody gave me advice from, you know, don't do anything, just listen, to, you know, go in there and, you know, start cutting and change things and sell things and do things. And, and you know, I'm, I'm actually, I took more of the advice in terms of listening. And really I spent, you know, a lot of time, I mean, you know, a lot of time traveling and listening to employees, to partners. I went to visit almost every office we have. Um, and Really, I think from a standpoint of what the 100 days was really about, and, and this came up very quickly, is it's really about strategy, right? You have to you forget about anything we do mechanically with the business and, and revenue and cost and those things. If we don't have the right strategy, we're not going to win. So we, I spent a lot of time looking for strategy points. What can the company be strong at? What can we be good at? The second piece is what's the, st what's the structure behind the strategy? How do we actually come up with the right structure to make sure we're going to meet the strategy goals? And then the third piece is, you know, really what is the revenue and cost plans behind the company? And that's where we are, you know, right now. And, and you know, without going into a tremendous amount of details, the other thing I took away from my 100 days, and I, there's been a lot of press about AOL because the press likes to write about AOL, but we didn't really do any press during the 100 days. And because my mantra has been employees first. I want, the, I want to hear from the employees first, and I want the employees to hear from me first, you know, about what we're doing. And, and so, you know, we did lots of town halls, uh, lots of uh, individual meetings, lots of, you know, management meetings, employee meetings, those things. And, and, and then after about a, being there for about a month, I kind of decided, look, at these people actually are very good employees. They want to win. And you know what? They seem to know what the strengths of the business are. So we started to peel projects off of my list and give it to the employees. What's the mission of the company, right? What are the strategy areas? What are the areas where that we're going to focus our brand on? What is the AOL brand? You know, those things. And so we started these work streams that worked across this 100-day period. And I remember when one meeting, we got to the mission statement meeting, and, and there was you know, probably about 200 employees in all of our global offices working on it. And they came, and they had three final suggestions. The employees don't know the final suggestion. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to talk about it tomorrow at our meeting. But they came with three, and they said, you make the final decision. This is what we came up with. And we looked through all their work and what they had done. And I said, look, you guys have done such a good job. You know, this is, this is the last mile. You guys go back, and you decide. And I will, we'll meet you in a week, but I want you to go back to all the offices. So that's really what the 100 days has been about. And I, and I, I, I do. We, we uh, did a survey of the employees at the end of the 100 days, which said, you know, do you believe in what we're doing? And 96% came back, we agree or strongly agree. Wow. you know, in the strategy. And I think that was powerful because it wasn't dictated to them. It was, you know, kind of groundswell of what we're going to be good at. You did take a very employee-centric approach to that, which I admire. Um, but, you know, you're the only person in the room who didn't see the results of the survey. So I, I don't want to tell you yet. Uh, but summarize, so that you have a chance to improve those numbers, summarize <laughs> why, you, <laughs> why you think that AOL can win? Because clearly, you wouldn't have, you're not, you're a very, 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 very competitive guy, which I know well. Uh, you wouldn't have taken the job if you didn't think this company could really turn around and, you know, in some fundamental way, start winning again. 
What's the basic argument why you think that's possible? Right. So I, th I think one is, you know, can you, at the core level, can we improve our products and services for consumers? The answer is definitively 100% yes. Um, there are a lot of things, forget about the technology for a minute, there's a lot of business decisions that have been made over the years which have defocused the company, unfocused the company on the consumer, what the consumer experience is. So one of the things we're doing right now is measuring you know, which is the internet space, and I've worked at a bunch of different internet companies and properties, you know, there's a core set of metrics that you measure every day, you know, page load speed, uh, server time, all that, those things, and, you know, the way I think about the business, and this is a very simplistic way to think about it, but, you know, there's, multi, there's hundreds of thousands of calls to the AOL servers every minute at AOL, all right? Can, we touch 107 million consumers in the U.S., 275 million globally. Wow. If we can improve those pages week over week, day over day, hour over hour, month over month, you know, will consumers notice the difference and will they be more willing to adopt and use AOL products and services? That's the bet we're making. That's, the bet, that's bet number one. Bet number two is um, if you're in this business and you think about where the money is going to come from in the future to fund the businesses and growth and content and, and services, um, you have to believe fundamentally, which I do, is in the recession, it has made companies speed up their look into the digital landscape. So, you know, when things were going very well and the economy was on an uptick, you know, people generally don't change their behavior that much in terms of the business side of the business. It's all good. Yeah, yes, I need to change, but, it, you know, I'll, I'll do it when I get around to it. The recession hits, and, you know, I went, I've gotten for, been very fortunate to visit thousands of companies also because a lot of my, my jobs in the past have been very external. You know, was there a deceleration or acceleration in terms of focus um, on digital and on marketing and on advertising, on distribution? You know, yes. I mean, is, is it move the, does the economy help move that transition up by 25%? I would argue yes. When that, you argue it should or that it is? No, it is. It is. I, 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 you see structural changes at the companies we deal with in terms of who's in charge, what they're doing. Just because the efficiencies on. are so un, un, it's, it's unavoidable. Measurable. It's measurable. Yeah, unarguable. Right? And yeah. it's unarguable. And, and also consumer behavior probably has accelerated during the, the recession also. Um, and when you take a step back and you say every corporation, you know, largely in the world, especially in the U.S., are they, are they, they have two dump trucks to load their money into, right? They have you know, more traditional media types to put their advertising dollars in and they're gonna drive down traditional media lane and they have in, the internet truck. Are they putting more or less cash in their truck and driving down internet lane? My guess is they put more cash in the internet truck, the dump truck, and they're driving down internet lane. And you know what? AOL has a big house, a big property, and a nice uh, you know, property on that lane and can we get the trucks to stop? Right? Can you know? Can, can you? Will you back a truck up into our driveway? And you know that is the that's the real big question here: is how how do we do that? You know, our house right now needs improvement. There's there's no doubt about it. And and, and I think that's actually something that the employee base is really geared up for. And I think our partners are supportive of as well. So, you know, if you think about the acceleration of digital services and the acceleration of focus on digital marketing and you look at the size of AOL's brand and the size of property we have, I would say that's a good bet for us. Um, it's a lot of work, but it's a good bet. Well, nobody knows uh, internet advertisers better than you, so that's probably a little bit of an asset too. I mean, you know who spends money on the internet. You know every one of them probably right. had dinner with every one of the big ones. Uh, let's go to the videotape. No, the audience is already asking questions, and unlike yesterday, I have the names attached. Tom, Tom Bettecare of AKQA, I'm so glad he asked this question. Why doesn't online display advertising get more respect from large advertisers? I, I mean, I have a very personal viewpoint on this, which is the display space, in, 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 you know, not Tom's company, but there have been companies which fought the encroachment of technology. And, you know, and in the non-display spaces, search and, and some other areas, um, affiliate marketing, um, there was nobody to fight against, right? So you had the opportunity to start these businesses from scratch. You had first-time customers who actually their careers got built off of doing search marketing, those things. In the display space, it was harder to be disruptive with technology because it was a very ingrained way it worked. And, and you had, you know, frankly, you had industry leaders out there saying, you know, it's, it's, you know they're going to kill the creativity of display with technology. And the, the, by the way, the opposite is true. Creativity is going to scale with technology. You can imagine if you're a creative director, um, the ability to not just do one or two um, creatives and run them, you know, a million times, but do, you know, a million creatives and run them 
10 million times. That's what the technology will bring to display space. Look at it, AOL's investing in the space. I think the other large people that we compete against are, are investing in the space. Um, and I think now in the last you know, 18 months, the technology side of display um, has started to kick in. And I think second of all is the um, respect from brand marketers is really starting to you know, kick in around it. They're interested in it. They want it to be successful. Um, so I think it'll get more respect. Um, people who have uh, non-electronic non questions, uh, analog questions. Yes? Uh, question. Um, clearly, you want AOL to grow quickly. Um, what will you sell and what will you buy as part of that? Uh, so, you know, we're in the process right now of uh, looking at another company, a number of companies externally. Uh, we're also, you know, AOL Ventures is someplace where, you know, AOL has done actually historically a fair amount of acquisitions over the time period. And I think we have, one of the things we're doing with AOL Ventures is taking some of the assets, you know, that were supposed to be more synergistic and ended up not being as synergistic inside and putting them in ventures and saying to them, you know, it's a little bit manifest destiny for you. Here's a corralled P&L. Here is, you know, you're not going to get affected by what happens at the rest of the company. You have the opportunity to grow. And if you grow, we're, we'll be willing to take outside investments from other people. If you think you're better outside of ventures, you know, we're happy to figure out a way for you to get outside of ventures and, and go off on your own. Um, but I, I don't, we, we don't have anything to specifically, you know, announce. And I think one thing we've been very careful about is making sure we don't lose the value in the stuff we own. The first day I got to AOL, two things happened. One, they gave me a list saying, here's the companies we're selling. Right, and I, today some of those companies are the key parts to our strategy, so we won't be selling them, uh, one. And two is they wanted, uh, they wanted me to sign a $400 million check the first day I was there. And um, so, you know, after three questions, we're not signing the check. Um, and that, those are the you things. You did sign it? I didn't sign it. You did didn't. not sign it. That doesn't sound. Um, and, uh, and so I think we're taking the, the, you know, investment, divestiture space very seriously. And we're trying to do it in a very methodical way, which, you know, both for the companies maybe coming in and the companies potentially going out, there's, there's maximum value. But I don't have any. Following specific. up on that, I mean, the most stunning uh, acquisition was Bebo for $850 million, which tellingly is now in that ventures bucket. Is that to say that AOL does not want to play in social networking? No, I think, you know, so when I, when I got to the company, there was, a, there was starting to be a very heavy integration between the instant messaging platforms and, um, and Bebo. And what happened was is as you mix those together, the, the purposes of those things, you know, theoretically, social networking and messaging work well together. I, I would say yes, right? You, but you have to have the right social network and the right messaging platform to put together to make them work. Correctly, I, I, I think Bebo had gotten very in, intertwined into the AOL side of things, and you know, if you ask me, is Bebo going to be more successful intertwined with ICQ and AIM inside of AOL, or if we put it into ventures and told the Bebo people, be really good at what you guys have been good at, um, you know, that's the bet we made. Bebo in ventures is going to have the opportunity to have, you know, again, a crowd P&L, investment money, those things, and they're going to have to basically, you know, work very hard to, and it's a very, I mean, you know social network, you more than anyone knows social network is the most competitive Well, well just quickly, you know, one of the things you said, I, we haven't touched on, but I know right. it's a big part of your belief, is that AOL has this enormous amount of data that will allow really good, effective targeting for the advertising. Now, that environment is shifting very rapidly, in my opinion, because of the incredible growth of Facebook, and it's ultimate ability to target in a way that nobody's ever done before. Do you think it's a landscape changing thing that Facebook is now a quarter billion heading possibly towards a lot bigger? Yeah, I think, I think first of all, in general, I think, first of all, privacy constrained data, which is, you know, good for the user, good for the marketer, more relevant ads. I think that landscape has changed a lot, just as, as, a, as a blanket statement. And I think underneath that, you have massive investments in, in ad networks, right? There's, everybody's got an ad network at this point. Um, you see companies, I think, And you like, have one, one we, of the biggest. Yeah, we do. Yeah, thank you. Biggest. Um, the biggest in this and, Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we, you know, we see that investment level. You see companies like a Facebook, I think, which are thinking about new ways to use data and targeting. And, and you know, again, w one of the most important aspects underneath, again, if you go below the surface on these things, is you know, is referral traffic and, and where people actually go, what they do, how they do it. You know, those things and the insights that you glean off of those things 
you know, over time are very important to, uh, you know, very important to marketers. And I think you, you know, over the course of time, as advertisers run these things at scale and they get more insights back in general, the, the companies that will end up doing better is exactly what I said about display. You know, historically, search has done this very well. Right? Display is just getting into it now. Um, the companies that are actually able to figure that out, and it's not just about the data, it's about the insight. So if you were, you know, Procter & Gamble or Kellogg's or Coke or whoever, you know, what is that actually, forget about the data, what is the insight you get out of it and how does that actually change your perception? You know, my guess is there's gonna be four, or five, 10 companies that do that really well and it's gonna be a very competitive landscape. Okay, uh, we, we are more or less out of time. I wanna do the exact same question again we did at the beginning. So can we get the question up on the screen and everybody remember how to use your little devicey you, thingies? You have to tell me what the first vote I, was. Well, I'm gonna tell you what the first vote was after we get the second one. Uh, I'm hoping for your sake it's slightly different, but uh, because I actually think you've got, let me just say from my point of view, What's I think your vote? they got the right guy here. <laughs> right now, I would vote for three, myself. I would, so that's me. Um, but I'm a very optimistic person. So uh, quickly vote, and then we're gonna hopefully be able to flash, flash back to the first one and see if there's any difference. This is, by the way, the first time Tim has spoken in public since you got the job, right? I did, I did one other thing that I pre-committed to, but. Today, this is the most So important. sorry to hear that. But anyway, we, we wouldn't have had you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, is everybody voting? Did you vote? And can we get the results uh, as soon as possible since I'm going to get in big trouble for... Uh... While you're waiting. What was on the cell list that you have kept, Adam wants to know? Uh, so Re Relegance is one. It's a company that was based out of Tel Aviv and uh, very, very good at doing uh, real-time news. Uh, search and uh, another one is Truvio, the video search company that AOL bought a few years ago, which is based in San Francisco. So I, I think those two actually are, are actually big assets. Okay, you moved the bar, Tim. Can we see the first one again? I'm sorry, David, we're not able to show you that. Could somebody tell me what the numbers were? Somebody must have written them down. What was it? it was 10 or 11 percent, number three. Number three was 10 or 11 percent, now you got 20 percent. But number two is a lot bigger than it was the first time, too, right? Does anybody remember what number two was the first time? 43, you moved it up to 50%, believing you'll be profitable. But still, that's better than, number one was much, much bigger the first time. What was number one the first time? So you cut 15 points off of the, the really negative. So you're a good presenter. This was you're, good. you're doing this was a, a good, good job. Trip. And thank good. you so much. Thank you. And, and thank I believe you're gonna make a difference. Thanks, David. So thank you. Thank you.